Hi, everyone. Thanks, Albert. Um, my name is Greg. Um, I'm Partner Development Manager at Google Play, and I lead a lot of our VR-focused, VR and AR-focused efforts um, in Europe. Um, so this talk will be so philosophical, a little, bit, a little bit practical, and the idea is to give you a taste of our vision for what we now call immersive computing, which we see now emerging through the frameworks of AR and VR. And perhaps most importantly, give you a little bit of inspiration and a way of thinking around this topic and what this might mean for you as a developer, and then explain some of the tools that we have in place today to help you succeed in this area. So let's start with the vision. So ultimately, this comes down to making technology work a lot more like we do. And does anyone know roughly what year this photo is from? No. 40s. So that's, so that's a computer punch card from the 40s. Um, and so that's obviously not the most frictionless and intuitive way of interacting with the computer. I think you all agree with that. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that smartphones were truly the first breakthrough in terms of kind of uh, innovation and interfaces and accessibility with computers and what they can do. Um, and still, the level of abstraction remains, right? So when you call a friend on your phone, you don't really see them like you see them in real life. You see this flat, lifeless version of them on the screen. And equally, when you're looking for a restaurant, your phone doesn't really walk you to the restaurant. You still have to look at your phone and see this blue dot and then find a way of navigating there. It's not ideal. It's getting better, but it's not ideal. So with immersive computing, we're saying that instead of staring at our screens and constantly checking our phones, we'll be able to interact with the world and computers in a more natural way. We'll be able to hold up our heads to the real and virtual worlds around us. OK, that's kind of the high-level philosophy as to how we think about this. So what is immersive computing? So the way we think of this is really as a spectrum, with AR and VR as two points on it. Um, so on the very right, we have virtual reality, which is fully computer generated. On the very left, you have reality, or you can call it real reality, as what we're taking part in right here. And in the middle, the sort of the middle part is augmented reality and this layer of computer generated reality that comes on top of our real world. Another way to put it is virtual reality can take you anywhere, as this beautiful image shows, and augmented reality can bring anything to you. So this is all kind of intuitive. So let's take a look at some of the efforts and the latest things that we've done in the augmented reality space. So if you think back 10 years ago, that was one of the first Android devices. Computers, so computers as phones have become a lot more powerful and sort of interesting in terms of what they can do, yet their understanding, contextual understanding of the world around them has become pretty limited. With AR, this equation will be changed dramatically. This will really bring the next big shift in terms of computers understanding the world around them in a completely different way. So at the most basic fundamental level, this is about providing timely and relevant digital information in the context of the real world. So here you've got an example of da Vinci's Lady with the Ermine where the very first version of the painting didn't even have the ermine. And then you can see the progression to the very final version, where actually the face of the lady has changed dramatically. And that's a really rich and interesting digital contextual information that you just wouldn't have access to in the same way without this AR technology. So what are some of the other use cases? Well, shopping is a really obvious and fun one and kind of immediately practically useful, where you can essentially overlay any digital object into a physical space and see what this is going to look like. 
you can learn about real life objects in a completely new and interactive way, which is kind of shown by this high end coffee machine where you can kind of learn and interact um, in this way. So games is obviously a huge use case, and you know, as we all know, um, Pokemon Go has really planted the seed in this space, and we are only going to see more and more amazing stuff coming in terms of gaming and AR. And last but not least, the example that I used earlier in terms of navigation, it becomes this contextual window onto the world where instead of holding down your phone and figuring out how to relate to it, how to, to relate to your external world as an external object, you'll actually be using the phone as a window and be able to see contextual information around you and navigational prompts in a much more intuitive way. So at Google, as a lot of you know, we started our AR efforts with Tango in 2014. Now, Tango was a hardware play, as intrinsically everything hardware, it's a lot harder to scale and distribute. So two months ago, we've announced AR Core, which is all about AR at the scale of Android. So let's take a quick look at what this can do. So motion tracking, this is a really fundamental aspect of AR. So it knows where your phone is in space. Secondly, environmental understanding. So as in this case, it knows that a table is indeed a table, and then you can place objects on it. The same goes for walls and ceilings. Light estimation, super important too, so that, as in this example, the object knows <laughs> when the light in the room is switched off, and it can adjust accordingly. Right now, this is running on Pixel devices and Samsung S8, with more um, OEMs coming on board very quickly, and we're expecting over 100 million devices very soon. The way we think of this is really as both a feature and a foundation, meaning that we certainly hope that you are able to integrate AR core and AR experiences within your existing apps, and we hope that this will give kind of birth to whole new types of experiences that are natively AR. Let's take a look at some of this in action now. We'll play the video. So that's for AR. And let's move on to VR now and see what we've done there uh, in the last couple of uh, months or so. So last year in November, we've launched Daydream, which is all about basically high-end premium VR experiences at the scale of Android, interactive experiences, and comfortable headsets. Then this year, we've announced even more devices that are supporting Daydream so that you can use Daydream on almost any high-end Android device. Most notably, Samsung S8 is now supporting Daydream as well, and we're expecting even more OEMs to come on board in the next year or so. In terms of software and hardware, and by the way, the new Google Daydream View with more colors and even more comfort. In terms of software, we have even more apps than before, so the momentum is quite strong. You know, let's keep in mind that developing for VR, and let's be honest about this, is still very hard and quite expensive. So we're trying to be very careful as to how we bring this to market. Having said that, all Android developers are now able to develop for VR, and we're seeing a lot more organic titles coming to the store, which we're supporting through featuring. In terms of the product itself 
and what Daydream looks like inside, we've made it even easier to discover, interact with, and share experiences in VR. So let's take a look at what this means. In terms of discovery, Daydream Home has an updated look with these new tabs at the top, which makes it even easier to engage users and keep users in VR for longer, therefore kind of developing this daily use of VR, which we think is so, so important by taking it sort of mainstream. Um, dashboard is extremely powerful as well. So this enables you to interact with your Android notifications without having to take off the headset. Casting, that was one of the most asked for, asked for features. So the power of Chromecast and Daydream now enables you to stream or cast your VR experience in the headset onto any large screen, therefore making the experience a lot more social. Screenshot and video capture is also here, so that you can now share your experiences on all the usual channels, making it more accessible for users to see what you're actually up to in your VR environment. Last but not least, and this is a really cool one, uh, YouTube co-watching. So you can actually experience YouTube on Daydream concurrently with your friends. So we've talked a lot about the philosophy, what we've done with AR and VR on the product side. And I want to leave you with a kind of a taste of the future. So this convergence of AR and VR, those two points in the spectrum, it's pretty inevitable. And we think this will enable a new type of devices to come to the market. The first one such device is the Lenovo all-in-one headset that will come to the market early next year. This will use part of the AR technology, such as motion tracking and depth perception, and will be obviously running Daydream, so you can interact with your VR experiences in a more richer and kind of untethered way with more functionality and more freedom to move. So beyond that, we've all heard the term mixed reality. And so let's see what shape that, ta that takes, most likely in form of devices that will combine both AR and VR in one. And so immersive computing and its future and present, frankly, is pretty exciting. And we're only just at the very beginning.